Hello, I'm delighted to share what I've learned about the life of Abraham Lincoln before he became politically ambitious, particularly his years growing up on the Midwestern frontier and how his early life shaped him. A man whose perseverance, determination, and iron will of conviction would hold North and South together during its darkest hours to form a more perfect union. Abe Lincoln was born February 12, 1809 in a one-room log cabin with dirt floors at the Sinking Spring Farm in what was then Hardin County, Kentucky. Abe was the second child born to Thomas and Nancy Hanks Lincoln. The first was Sarah and the third was Thomas, whose death in infancy at the Knob Creek Farm Lincoln remembered. This photograph is of a replicated log cabin from the same time period and is housed inside a memorial today. The original log cabin was dismantled piece by piece sometime before 1865 and was used in the construction of other buildings in the area. Abe's mother, Nancy, was most likely illegitimate, and this was a fact that bothered Lincoln throughout his life, but he is quoted as saying, I don't know who my grandfather was. I am much more concerned to know who his grandson will be. Nancy learned to read by the Bible, was skilled in the crafts a frontier woman needed to know in order to grow crops and clothe and feed her family. She was a fine seamstress, and it was she who taught a very young Abe to read, using that very same King James Bible. Nancy was also described as a bold, reckless, daredevil kind of woman, stepping on to the very verge of propriety. Abraham was to remark long after her death, all that I am or hope ever to be, I get from my mother. When Abe was two years old, the Lincoln family moved to the Knob Creek Farm northeast of Hogdenville, where the land was more fertile. There is a log cabin on this site now, but it is not the Lincoln's cabin. Officials believe the cabin belonged to one of the Lincoln's neighbors and was moved to the Knob Creek farm site. Lincoln said some of his earliest memories came from Knob Hill. Besides his brother's death, he remembered a neighbor's son saving him from a near drowning in the creek. He could recall that he and his father painstakingly planted corn and pumpkins, the flooding waters wiping out the crops, and he could remember sometimes attending an ABC school with his sister Sarah. Abraham Lincoln was mostly self-educated. He estimated his formal schooling consisted of about 12 months with big gaps in between, but he was an avid and eager reader and continued to be so throughout his life. Times were tough at Knob Creek. Not only were the Lincolns the poorest of the poor, but Thomas Lincoln lost three farms in Kentucky because of the complicated and chaotic land laws in the state. He could not afford to pay an attorney to fight the never-ending border disputes. Abe rarely spoke about his growing up years and the family's abject poverty, though he did recount years later in a discussion with homeless boys in New York that he had been poor and could remember, quote, when my toes stuck out through my broken shoes in the winter, when my arms were out at the elbows, when I shivered with cold. Abe's father, Thomas Lincoln, was an itinerant, uneducated farmer, but he was also descended from wealthy landowners. The earliest ancestor was a weaver's apprentice who had migrated from England to Massachusetts in 1637. Thomas Lincoln was a fairly talented carpenter but also described as an uneducated man, a plain, unpretending, plodding man. 
His own father had died when he was just a child, and he'd had to go to work as a laborer, never having had the luxury of an education. But he had common sense, was known for his civil service, his storytelling ability, and good humor. It was while living at Knob Creek that Thomas Lincoln was made annual road surveyor and became the 15th wealthiest of 98 property owners by 1814. But those were better days. In 1816, Thomas Lincoln decided to quit Kentucky altogether and moved the family to the Little Pigeon Creek community in what is now Perry County, Indiana. Abe was seven. Thomas purchased land in accordance with the Land Ordinance of 1785, partly because slavery had been excluded in Indiana by the Northwest Ordinance. Abraham Lincoln claimed many years later that his father's move from Kentucky to Indiana was partly on account of slavery, but chiefly on account of the difficulty of land titles in Kentucky. In Indiana, Thomas Lincoln worked as a farmer, cabinet maker, and carpenter. He owned farms, several town lots and livestock, paid taxes, sat on juries, appraised estates, served on county slave patrols, and guarded prisoners. He and Nancy were also members of a separate Baptist church, which opposed dancing, drinking, and slavery. Abe Lincoln later described life growing up on that farm as a fight with trees and logs and grubs. While the family worked hard at farming, Thomas had to rely on hunting most days in order to feed his family. He eventually built a one-room cabin for the family, but there was no flooring and little furniture. The Lincoln family slept on corn husk beds that frequently were infested by bugs and rodents. In 1818, Nancy Lincoln died from what they called a wasting disease. Perhaps it was consumption, also known as tuberculosis, or milk poisoning. Milk poisoning is uncommonly rare today, but back then many people became ill and died from the sickness, especially in the Ohio Valley where the snake root plant grows like wildflowers and is a favorite of cows and other livestock. People did not know that it poisoned both the milk and the meat. So when the cow ate the plant, not only did the cow die, but so did the person who ingested the milk or the meat of that cow. Another theory is that she had Marfanoid habitus or Marfan syndrome, which is a genetic disease of the connective tissues. People who have this condition tend to be tall, thin, with long arms, fingers, legs, and toes. They can live full and productive lives, or they can suffer symptoms such as heart palpitations, aortic aneurysms, a high arched palate, sleep apnea, and a whole host of other symptoms. William Herndon, Lincoln's former law partner and author of Life of Lincoln, described Nancy Hanks Lincoln this way. She was above the ordinary in height, stature, weighed about 130 pounds, was slenderly built, and had much the appearance of one inclined to consumption. Her skin was dark, hair dark brown, eyes gray and small, forehead prominent, face sharp and angular, with a marked expression for melancholy which fixed itself in the memory of all who ever saw or knew her. Abraham was deeply affected by her loss and said that she modeled sweetness and benevolence. Older sister Sarah was left to care for young Abe and their second cousin, Dennis Hanks, whom their mother had adopted. Hanks was 10 years older than Abraham, but the two were very close. 
After Nancy died, Thomas left Abe and Sarah for six months while he returned to Elizabethtown, Kentucky to find a wife. He was exhausted from trying to farm, tend the children, and hunt game to feed the family. While he was gone, Abe and Sarah had little to eat other than dried berries that had been stored away by their mother, Nancy. A neighbor who stopped by reported that the children were terribly skinny, filthy, and the house was in terrible condition. The children must have been convinced that they had been abandoned. Thomas Lincoln had met Sarah Bush Johnston in Elizabethtown, which is where he had married Nancy. He had heard that Sarah, or Sally as she was called, was a widow. His proposal was apparently, I have no wife and you have no husband. I came a purpose to marry you. I knowed you from a gal and you knowed me from a boy. I've no time to lose, and if you're willing, let it be done straight off. She agreed. He paid off her debts, and she and her three children, Matilda, Elizabeth, and John, moved to the farm in Indiana, where she became stepmother to the Lincoln children. Sarah cleaned up the entire Lincoln household, from the children to insisting that Thomas install a wooden floor to replace the cabin's dirt floor, and making sure a loft was built for the boys, John Johnston, Abraham Lincoln, and Dennis Hanks, to sleep in, to ensuring that the cabin roof was finished. An interesting side note, in 1821, Dennis Hanks married Sarah's daughter, Elizabeth. Abe bonded with his stepmother almost immediately. It said that when she and his father pulled up in the buggy to the farm, he buried his face in her skirts. He called her mother. Sally was a great source of comfort and support to him, talking to him, taking an interest in his learning, encouraging him to read, and often taking his side in arguments with his father. Many of their neighbors believed Abe was lazy for all his reading, writing, scribbling, ciphering, writing poetry, etc., and probably did all those things just to get out of hard work. If asked what he was allergic to, his answer would have been work. Often quoted, Abe supposedly said, My father taught me to work. He didn't teach me to like it much. Many of Abe's friends and relatives also spoke about his love of animals. During his lifetime, he had dogs, cats, goats, and horses. It is said that as a young boy, he preached sermons to his family, declaring that he was against cruelty to animals. Sarah admitted that Abe did not enjoy physical labor, but insisted that he had a great mind. Abe would walk for miles to borrow a book and especially liked the King James Bible, which is what he'd learned to read with his mother, Nancy. He also enjoyed Aesop's Fables, Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, and Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. Many of these were books that Sally had brought with her from Kentucky. I've mentioned that Lincoln had no prolonged formal schooling. He once wrote about his Indiana childhood. It was a wild region with many bears and other wild animals still in the woods. There I grew up. There were some schools, so-called, but no qualification was ever required of a teacher beyond reading, writing, and ciphering to the rule of three. If a straggler supposed to understand Latin happened to sojourn in the neighborhood, he was looked upon as a wizard. It is an understatement to say that life on the frontier was hard. Abe Lincoln, while still in his teens, was tall for his age, much like his mother Nancy. He was strong, athletic, and particularly handy with an axe. 
and performed all the chores that a boy growing up on a frontier household was expected to do. He split a lot of wood, but he became increasingly resentful about his stepbrother John, from whom his father did not demand as much, and more and more estranged from a man who he felt treated him more as a slave than as a son. Because of his failing eyesight and likely poor health, Thomas Lincoln leaned on Abe to run the farm. He loaned Abe out to the neighbors and, as was customary, kept the wages Abe earned. He was a stern disciplinarian who would cane, slap, or knock Abe down for minor infractions and innocent mistakes like forgetting a chore or speaking to strangers who had approached the family farm before he had had a chance to speak to them first. Abe looked forward to the time when he could move out on his own. When Abe was 17, his sister Sarah Lincoln married Aaron Grigsby. She and her husband attended the Little Pigeon Baptist Church, a primitive Baptist church where her father Thomas was a trustee. Abe occasionally went to church and listened to the sermons, but he sometimes got in trouble for reenacting the minister's sermons as parodies. When Sarah died giving birth to a stillborn son less than two years after she had married, Abe was distraught. He blamed her death on the failure of Grigsby to send for a doctor. She was buried in a small cemetery next to the church. Both the church and Sarah's gravesite are located within what was the Little Pigeon Creek community and is now Lincoln State Park in Indiana. There were some lighter moments in the Lincoln household, though. Abe and his stepmother, Sarah, had a very good relationship, and his sense of humor was probably influenced by her. When he was 18 years old, Lincoln was 6'4", was so tall that his head nearly touched the ceiling of the family's farmhouse kitchen. Sarah used to tease Abe and say that he was so tall that he needed to keep his hair washed or he'd leave prints on her ceiling. Abe decided to have some fun with that, and one day when his stepmother wasn't home, Abe got a group of younger boys together and had them dip their bare feet in the mud outside the cabin's kitchen. Then, remember, Abe was strong. He took each of the boys inside, held them upside down, and had them walk their feet across the kitchen ceiling. It left muddy footprints all across the top. And when his stepmother came in and saw those muddy footprints, she laughed and threatened to tan his hide. In 1828, at the age of 19, and perhaps to escape the sadness of his sister's death, Abe made the first of two flatboat trips to New Orleans down the Mississippi River. He served as a bow hand on a two-man vessel owned and captained by Alan Gentry, who was the son of James Gentry, a store owner near the Lincoln's farm. The two were attacked by a group of African-American slaves who tried to steal their cargo, but Lincoln and Gentry were able to defend their boat and repel their attackers. Lincoln was paid $8 a month, and the trip was an eye-opening experience for him. It expanded his world beyond the narrow backwoods of Pigeon Creek, Indiana. It also took him to the slave state region of the lower Mississippi Valley, possibly the slave markets of New Orleans, and by his own admission, instilled a lifelong hatred of slavery. Upon his return to Indiana, Abe dutifully and resentfully gave his full earnings over to his father. In early March 1830, when Abe was 21, his immediate and extended family moved west to Macon County, 10 miles west of Decatur, Illinois, another non-slaveholding state. This slide shows one of Lloyd Ostendorf's illustrations known as the Walking Three. 
Historians disagree on who initiated the move. Thomas Lincoln had no reason to leave Indiana, but he was a restless man, and it's possible that the other family members, including Dennis Hanks, might have needed to move. You will recall that Hanks was married to Sarah's daughter, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth did not want to move without her mother. Sarah may have persuaded Thomas to make the move. Plus, there had been another outbreak of milk sickness, so he may have been trying to avoid that as well. Relations between Abe and Thomas were strained at best, but they became even worse after the move to Illinois. In 1831, Thomas and other members of the family prepared to move to a new homestead in Coles County, Illinois. Once Abe had helped his father build and settle into the first cabin, he felt he was old enough to strike out on his own. Abe did come back occasionally over the years after Thomas had died, but he did not attend his father's funeral in 1851, nor would he pay for the grave's headstone. Thomas and Sarah were not invited to Abraham and Mary Todd Lincoln's wedding, and neither of them ever saw any of the younger Lincoln's children. Abe's final visit with Sarah was before he left Illinois for the White House, and he supported her until she died. Sarah outlived her stepson, dying four years after Abraham's assassination. When Thomas lay on his deathbed, Abraham sent word to his stepbrother to say to him that if we could meet now, it is doubtful whether it would not be more painful than pleasant, but that if it be his lot to go now, he will soon have a joyous meeting with many loved ones gone before, and where the rest of us, through the help of God, hope ere long to join them. Abe, along with his stepbrother John Johnston and a cousin John Hanks, accepted an offer from a store owner named Denton Offutt to take a load of cargo with him to New Orleans. They left for Springfield in early May of 1831 and floated down the Sangamon River. They had some difficulty with the boat near the town of New Salem, and Offutt, who thought the town had a lot of potential, decided to rent the mill and open a general store. I mention the difficulty with the boat because what Abe Lincoln is our only president to have a patent. He developed a device that would lift a boat over shoals or other obstructions without necessitating unloading the boat to make it lighter. He was always interested in the way things worked. Despite the fact that Abe spoke with a backwoods twang, Offutt had been impressed with Lincoln's honesty, work ethic, and ingenuity. The two men returned to New Salem after they discharged their cargo in New Orleans, and Offutt hired Lincoln as his store clerk. For the next six years, Lincoln worked more on his education than he did at Offutt's general store. In New Salem, Abe gained a reputation in the community for his good humor, his storytelling abilities, his brawn, and his audacity. Denton Offutt, Lincoln's boss, had bragged that Lincoln could beat anybody in a wrestling match. Jack Armstrong, the renowned leader of a group of ruffians known as the Clary's Grove Boys, heard the boast and challenged Lincoln to a match, which Lincoln accepted. Offutt bet $10 that Lincoln would win. According to witnesses, the two circled each other warily. Lincoln seemed to be getting the better of Armstrong, plus he was known to talk a little smack in the ring. Armstrong, frustrated by Lincoln's enormous reach, started fouling. Lincoln finally lost his temper, picked up Armstrong, and threw him to the ground, knocking him out. Then Armstrong's gang backed Lincoln up against the walls of Offutt's store, and it looked for a time like Lincoln was done for. But Armstrong recovered in time to stop his gang from starting a brawl. 
Armstrong was impressed with Lincoln. He came forward, shook Lincoln's hand heartily and said, boys, from now on, Lincoln will be one of us. Armstrong and Lincoln became friends, and in fact, Lincoln used to stay with Armstrong and his wife Hannah when he was periodically out of work. Lincoln was quite an accomplished wrestler. He was defeated only once in about 300 matches. He lost to a member of his unit from the Black Hawk War, and he is enshrined in the Wrestling Hall of Fame. In 1858, Lincoln returned the favor when he represented Duff Armstrong, son of Jack and Hannah, in a murder trial in Beardstown, Illinois. Known as the Almanac Trial, the story goes like this. Lincoln produced an 1857 Almanac, which was the year the incident occurred, to argue that the state's witness could not have seen Armstrong kill the victim. There was no moonlight at the time and he was a long distance from Armstrong, so theoretically he could not have seen that far in the dark. Lincoln also produced a witness who helped acquit Armstrong. When Hannah asked Lincoln how much they owed him, Lincoln replied, Why, Hannah, I shan't charge you a cent. Never. Anything I can do for you, I will do so willingly and without charges. Most of the people in New Salem were illiterate, so Lincoln also became a popular member of the community by working in the general store and reading for his neighbors. For his part, Lincoln was able to work on his grammar and social skills. He attended several meetings of the local debating club. His efficiency and success in managing the general store, the grist mill, and sawmill caught the attention of the town's leaders, who believed Lincoln could represent their interests. They encouraged him to run for office. In August of 1832, he decided to become a candidate for one of four representatives of Sangamon County in the Illinois legislature, despite being a resident in the county for only nine months. His campaign platform centered on improvements to the navigation of the Sangamon River that he would initiate. When the Black Hawk War broke out in 1832 between the United States and the Native Americans, the volunteers in the area elected Lincoln to be their captain. He saw no combat during the time except for a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes, but he was able to make several important political connections. When he returned to New Salem, it was election time. By then, though, there were 13 candidates, and he finished eighth on the ballot. But he won over 90% of the New Salem vote. Discouraged, Abe decided to enter a partnership in 1833 with William Berry to purchase Denton Offutt's store on credit. Thinking that New Salem was an up-and-coming town, Lincoln believed the purchase would earn him great profits. Unfortunately, the Lincoln Berry General Store failed, even after Berry had purchased a liquor license. Berry abandoned Lincoln, attempts to sell the store were unsuccessful, and Lincoln was stuck with a debt that would take him 17 years to pay off. On May 7, 1833, Abe was appointed postmaster of New Salem by President Andrew Jackson. He earned $55 a year and supplemented that income by chopping wood and splitting rails. But as the population of New Salem declined over the next few years, it became too small for a post office and Abe was out of a job. That same year, Lincoln was hired to survey new lands acquired by Sangamon County, despite the fact that he had no training as a surveyor. According to legend, it took Abe only six weeks to learn the trade, and from that point on, he was considered to be an excellent surveyor. In 1834, he made his first known land survey and would campaign again for representative in the Illinois State Legislature. 
Now that he was well known in a larger portion of Sangamon County, Abe traveled from village to village, giving speeches, attending shooting matches, horse races, and other community events. Again, there were 13 candidates, but this time Abe won. Perhaps the most common image of Abraham Lincoln as a young man is Lincoln the rail splitter. There is no doubt that Lincoln split logs for fences and the family cabin when the Lincolns moved from Indiana to Illinois in 1830, but Lincoln was not nicknamed the rail splitter until the 1860 Republican Party National Convention when supporters of his candidacy marched through the convention hall with two rails they claimed were from a lot of 3,000 made in 1830 by Thomas Hanks and Abe Lincoln and trumpeted Lincoln as the rail candidate. Soon the image of a young Lincoln with an ax in hand was everywhere on the masthead of this campaign newspaper, for example. I must mention the two women in my talk. Soon after Abe moved to New Salem, he met Anne Rutledge. Her father, along with another man, had founded New Salem. Scholars and historians have argued over their relationship for years. They do not agree on the significance of their relationship, but according to many, Anne Rutledge was Abe's first love. At first, they were probably just close friends and may have reached an understanding that they would be married after Anne finished her studies, but a wave of what is believed to have been typhoid fever swept into New Salem, taking Anne Rutledge along with it. Anne died in 1835 at the age of 22 and Lincoln went through a bout of severe depression. Years later, a close friend asked Lincoln if he had ever loved Anne Rutledge, and he replied, It is true. True indeed, I did. I loved the woman dearly and soundly. She was a handsome girl, would have made a good, loving wife. I did honestly and truly love the girl, and often, often think of her now. Lincoln Springfield law partner William Herndon and Mary Lincoln did not get along and Herndon used to throw this first love in her face after Lincoln's death. In either 1833 or 34 before Anne died, Lincoln had met Mary Owens, the sister of his friend Elizabeth Abel, when she was visiting from her home in Kentucky. A year after Anne died, Lincoln agreed in a conversation with Elizabeth that he would court Mary if she ever returned to New Salem. She did, and Lincoln courted her for a while, but neither was very enamored of the other. In 1837, Lincoln wrote Mary a letter from Springfield where he had relocated to practice law, suggesting an end to the relationship. She never replied, and the courtship was over. Two years later, Mary Todd moved into her sister Elizabeth Edwards' house in Springfield, Illinois, and the rest, as they say, is history. Abraham Lincoln rose from humble beginnings, taught himself to read, and put his gregarious nature and gift of storytelling to use. Behind that affable demeanor lay a shrewd and brilliant man who rose to become one of our country's most admirable men. I hope you have enjoyed learning more about the life of Abraham Lincoln's early years. Thank you.